Good morning. Um, thank you uh, for continuing this uh, very nice conference. Now we have the BB, uh, BBVA lecture. We thank BBVA for this partnership that we are having, La Sea Lames, uh, Lames Conference. We expect to continue with this partnership in the following years. Now, as part of this uh, co uh, sponsorship, the BBVA lecture, we have invited Horacio Atanasio. Horacio Atanasio is the Coles Professor of Economics at Yale University, a research fellow and one of the directors of the ESRC Center for the Macroeconomic Analysis of Public Policy at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. He's a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, a senior fellow at the Bureau for Research and Economic Analysis of Development, and a research fellow at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. After obtaining the PhD at the London School of Economics, Horacio taught at the Stanford University and the University of Bologna. He was also a national fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford and visiting professor at the University of Chicago. Before joining Yale, he was the Jeremy Bentham Professor of Economics at University College London. He has been managing uh, editor of the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of the European Economic Association and Quantitative Economics. In 2016, he was awarded the Carlos Diaz Alejandro Prize by La Sea and the Klaus Jacobs Research Prize by the Jacob Foundation. In 2017, he was elected second vice president of the Econometric Society to serve as president in 2020. Horacio's research interests include household consumption, saving and labor supply behavior, risk sharing, evaluation and design of policies in developing countries, human capital accumulation in developing countries, early years interventions, microcredit, measurement tools in service. He has carried out evaluations of education financing and access programs, including large conditional cash transfer programs, the impact of a scholarship on school enrollment, and the effect of sub subjective expectations on the returns to education. Horacio's policy focused work includes, in Mexico, serving on the advisory board of Progres Oportunidades, assessing the impact of a high school scholarship program for the Ministry of Education, and evaluating jóvenes con oportunidades. In Colombia, directing the evaluation of the conditional cash transfer program, a training program for unemployed youth, a workfare program, and several child stimulations programs. In India, the evaluation of large early childhood development intervention. In Ghana, the evaluation of lively minds, a child care intervention currently being scaled up. In Chile, assessing pension reforms and serving on the Comisión Asesora Presidencial sobre el Sistema de Pensiones. Let's welcome Horacio Atanasio. All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the, are the slides on? No. Okay. Uh, it is a real pleasure to to be here uh, to another uh, La Sea Lames conference, and uh, it's a great honor to be invited to uh, to give this um, uh, BBVA uh, lecture. Uh, you know, it's been a, a great three uh, two two days, hopefully the, the third one was, uh, is going to be great as well. Uh, La Sea and Lamas conferences all, have always been one of my favorite and it's nice to be back in person after the Puebla uh, meeting three years ago. So today I'm going to talk about uh, subjective expectations. The issue of measurement has been very um, important for me in recent um, uh, years. Uh, been thinking about the way we economists uh, measure things and uh, that we then use in econometric and empirical analysis. And uh, I think we have been pretty shy for many years about um, measuring uh, variables other than uh, uh, prices and real choices that people make and the like. And in particular, we have been shy about measuring uh, things like subjective expectations. Uh, the consequence of that, there were good reasons to be shy, to be, because it's not easy, and we'll see some of the difficulties here. <coughs> but 
But the consequence of that was that when we uh, looked at models where expectations are important, we are forced to make some very arbitrary, uh, some sometimes very strong assumptions like uh, r rational expectations and the like. So um, this paper, uh, which is in collaboration with uh, uh, Manola Reyano and uh, Britta Osberg and Sam Crossman at the IFS, um, what, what we do in this paper, we take uh, two um, subjective expectation data sets, <coughs> or rather, two data sets that contain, in addition to regular uh, variables like income and consumption and the like, also contains uh, um, a, a data on subjective expectations. One was uh, collected in, in Colombia, and one we collected in, uh, in India. Um, so both, both data sets were run by us or by a subset of us and were linked to the, to the evaluation of some, uh, some interventions. Uh, the, the, uh, Pablo mentioned the evaluation of the conditional cash transfer in Colombia. That's where we collected this data uh, at the time. And so in this paper, what we do is to show how we can use this data uh, to estimate fairly uh, common models that are used in the literature. Um, why expectations? Expectations are obviously a, a extremely uh, important uh, and key to understanding many uh, economic choices. And the reason is that most decisions involve uncertainty um, and, uh, and therefore people uh, think about the future when making choices, when to buy a car, when to go to college, where to go to college, uh, what kind of um, insurance um, uh, arrangements you might take in, in the front of uh, expectations. And so all these individual choices are driven by the way people may, uh, take uh, expectations and how they're formed. And as a consequence, uh, they are important um, to, um, uh, uh, for policy interventions and for policy analysis. The, um, the expected value of certain variables is in many situations is not the only thing that matters. Uh, the entire distribution, the entire um, distribution of future uncertain variables might be important. Think of uncertainty. Uncertainty is the variance or some sort of dispersion of, uh, of future uh, economic variables. Uh, and those are important determinants of uh, um, you know, consumption and saving decisions. There is entire literature devoted to uh, precautionary savings, uh, for instance. Uh, and this uh, is key to um, the development of resharing arrangements uh, Resharing is particularly important because uh, the, the way um, expectations are because it depends on the degree of correlations among different individuals and the like. Uh, when you are in the business of, I, in the first part of my career, I worked a lot on consumption models, life cycle models, and there characterizing uh, to establish the properties of, uh, of uh, consumption, it is uh, key to characterize the uh, income process. Um, and, uh, and so uh, that, that's important. And it's particularly important in developing countries where uncertainty and fluctuations in income can have dramatic consequences being the, uh, the mean level of income particularly low. Now, as I said, in, in the conventional approach in, the in most of the literature has been to, uh, to identify the stochastic processes, characterize the stochastic processes uh, for income and other variables, is usually to rely on uh, um, realized, uh, the dynamics of realized variables. So what is the income level for a number of individuals uh, over, over time, um, <clears throat> often in combination with, uh, with model or choices. An alternative approach, which is the one we, we uh, follow here, is to rely on uh, subjective probabilistic expectation questions from, from survey. 
Now, the, these expectations were received by the profession with some skepticism for, for quite a bit of time, but now it's been almost 20 years, or probably about 10 years, where they become more and more popular and more and more used. The contribution of Chuck Mansky and his students have been uh, very uh, key in this respect. Chuck has been pushing the use of subjective expectations and proposing methods to use them, to, to co collate them and, and to analyze this data quite, quite a bit, and has been uh, very important. And this has become uh, also common in some developing, in some data collected in developing countries. I have a paper in the American Economic Review where we uh, look at some, uh, some of the data available in developing countries. Unfortunately, probabilistic questions are still absent for most uh, uh, household uh, surveys. Now, this is, um, these are no new things. You know, subjective expectation data were present in the 60s in the US, in the NLS data. They're sometimes known as the Parnes data. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Chuck Banksy has been pushing this agenda very, uh, very much. And now, you know, the, uh, the Bank of Italy has been uh, collecting data on subjective expectations for quite some time. Since 2013, the New York Fed has collected very rich and sophisticated data. I will uh, refer to this at the end of the talk. And, uh, and there are several other central banks, including the ECB, the Bank of Spain, and the Bank of Canada that have been collecting uh, similar data. Uh, and uh, not only this data has been collected, but now they, uh, uh, they're used, they're put to use in, in uh, uh, not just in uh, descriptive papers, but also in uh, structural uh, work. <coughs> and this is an incomplete list of papers that have been uh, doing uh, this type of uh, things using data from all, all, all sorts of uh, uh, the world. The last paper that uh, Faberman et al. 2022 is an econometric and this uh, uses the New York Fed data. Um, just, you know, just an example. Now, they, they were, they, they, this is the first motivation of, uh, of, of this paper, of this work that, uh, that I'm presenting today. The second uh, uh, important motivation is the uh, the need to characterize flexible income processes. Um, you know, for a long time, especially when studying the, the life cycle model, we have been using very, um, uh, very simple, linear, typically log linear specification for individual income processes. And uh, uh, recently, uh, there have been a number of important papers that have, um, that, um, have pointed out to the fact that the, the, um, there are important deviations uh, from the linearity in, uh, in real income process. The, an important paper that we, we use here is the Arellano, uh, uh, Blandel and Bonhomme in econometric again in 2017, where they specify a model that we'll look at later on, uh, which is uh, uh, very nonlinear. And this can be extremely important to determine the in consumption choices, these uh, this nonlinearities. The fact that, say, the persistence of income my va is not constant, but might vary across individuals and across realizations of, of current income. Analogously, the, the variability of income can, can vary dep depending on where, where in the range of, uh, of, of things you are. Um, <coughs> So what we do is we estimate this uh, flexible income process using two separate, uh, separate longitudinal survey data collected in India and in Colombia. Uh, at the beginning, I will show you some, uh, will give you some information on how we collected this data. Uh, and this is important for, to characterize the econometric approach that we use to that. Um, and so we use a method which is similar to the one proposed by Dominic Zemansky in 1997. And in those surveys, we also have data on actual uh, realized income. Uh, so we use a combination of that. And, and we'll have uh, two waves of the Indian survey and two waves of the Colombian survey. Um, so let me skip this. 
So the, uh, the, the main contributions of, the, uh, of, of, the, of these quarks are three. Uh, the first one we show how to identify the parameters of a standard um, uh, dynamic model with or without fixed effect using data on subjective expectations and current income. Notice we are looking at dynamic models if you forget for a second the presence of a fixed effect, we'll show that we can identify the dynamics from a single cross-section. This is kind of obvious because the future is, the, is asked directly uh, uh, to the individuals through the subjective expectations. So, the, so that's what informs dynamics. It's a trivial point, but the reason I want to stress it here is because the all uh, identification of structural parameter, the approach to identifying the structural parameter takes a completely different uh, approach. And, and, and I'll come back to this because I think that's an important uh, methodological uh, thing. After uh, illustrating this, this uh, methodological point, the second is that we uh, show how to do it uh, to estimate it uh, very flexible. Uh, non-linear models. This is the Adriano, Blandell, and Bonhomme uh, uh, model, and, uh, and we, we show how to, to do that. And then uh, uh, we show how to use that in practice, and that allows us to uh, identify measures of uh, subjective income risks that is completely different or might be distinguished by the variability over time. Uh, we can explicitly distinguish between uncertainty and variability. It could be that an income process is extremely variable, but maybe the economic agents know the, the determinations of this, so there might not be much uncertainty. And uh, with the use of subjective data, we can, we can distinguish that. So this is the outline, after this long introduction, this is the outline of my talk. I'll start with the uh, data uh, and uh, expectation elicitation and talk about the data sources. So the first one is India. We, we use data that uh, actually Brita collected almost on, on her own uh, in, uh, to evaluate a microfinance in, in intervention in Andhra Pradesh in India. Um, in that case, the population that we consider are uh, relatively poor households. They depend on agriculture as their main source of income. Uh, and they are um, farmers or agricultural laborers. We have two waves of data. The first was collected in 2008 and the second in 2009, and we have 720 households. And as I said, these are uh, primarily agricultural occupations, uh, uh, very low education. 63% uh, of our sample have no formal education. I stress this because, you know, we'll ask probabilistic questions to these people. And I think that's feasible if you do it uh, proper, proper, properly. You know, you, you cannot ask them, you know, what's your CDF? But, uh, uh, but you can design the questions uh, in a way that can be answered. And I, I think people have in their head the probability. Uh, the, this, we have a paper with Britta where we show that uh, descriptively that these data do make sense in, in a variety of, of, uh, of dimensions. <coughs> the second data set is from Colombia. And uh, as I mentioned, the data was used um, to uh, evaluate the conditional transfer, cash transfer program in Colombia called Familias en Acción. And uh, so these are all households that are beneficiary or potential beneficiaries of that uh, household. So the bottom 20% of the, of the income distribution in Colombia, roughly, is, is, is been one is the indicator that in Colombia is used to target most uh, welfare programs. So uh, we have, um, uh, we used the two waves of data. The first was uh, collected in 2003, and the second one between uh, 2005 and 2006. And we have 8,562 uh, households. And this is a balanced sample uh, across. This live in about 120 municipalities, small places in Colombia. Again, it's a relatively poor sample. Um, you know, 65% are, uh, of the respondents are female. This is because of the, the way 
the the program that we are evaluating, the mean average is 43 years. They have 3.5 years of schooling, so re relatively low level of education. Uh, how do we elicit this data and information? So that's, uh, that's the way we do it. So in each uh, wave of the survey, and this is done uh, exactly the same way in India and in Colombia. In each wave of the survey, subjective expectations uh, uh, are elicited. And again, we don't elicit a, a point expectation. What do, what do you expect your income is going to be next year? Rather, we try to uh, uh, get an idea of the entire distribution of future income. Um, in this uh, picture here, uh, this is very similar to the approach used by Dominic Zemanski, as I mentioned. In this picture, the, uh, the blue things are uh, answers given by the respondent. The red things are uh, quantities computed by the interviewer. So let me tell you how this is done. The first thing that we ask, we ask, uh, um, I don't have here the, the exact wording, but uh, we ask the family, suppose that things next year go really, really well. Everything is uh, rosy and uh, at the top of your expectations. What is your, the maximum income that you, your household will be receiving under this scenario? It's a fairly long script. And then we say, so, and so that's the max in blue there. And then we say, suppose that things are really bad. Everything is the worst possible thing. What is the minimum that your household is going to have? And so, uh, w after quite a bit of piloting we, uh, and changes to the to the way we uh, to the script to describe these situations, <coughs> we see that um, these questions are pretty well understood, and uh, and so these these two are are uh, in general not just in Colombia but in a variety of other contexts where we implemented this method that work pretty well. This is important because. Uh, um, we let the responder anchor the, the range, the position of their income, and the variability of their income in a fairly simple way. So we don't impose uh, ourselves. So what's the, uh, you know, what's the probability that your income is going to be more than half a million? We, we let them do the anchoring of this. So once they give those two answers, the interviewer computes A, B, and C. So B will, is going to be the midpoint between max and min, and the A is going to be the midpoint between the min and, 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 and B. And then they ask, what's the probability that your income is going to be larger than A? What's the probability that the income is going to be larger than B and larger than C? So this effectively give you three points of the CDF. It's, not, it's the reverse of the CDF. But, um, but you get uh, three points of the CDF uh, that, that people have. That's, not, that's the hardest part to ask because uh, uh, these are probability questions, so you have, to, uh, you have to train them. So before asking these questions, we typically provide a number of examples. Say, what's the probability that tomorrow is going to rain? And then we, because we want to uh, train them in... in um, how this thing changes. Uh, so after they answer the, the tomorrow rain question, what, what is the probability that next week is going to rain and that next month is going to rain? At that point, you know, the, uh, this probability should be increasing or not decreasing. Uh, if they make a mistake at that point, we correct them. And they say, look, if you say that it's 50% uh, that it's going to rain tomorrow, cannot be that this 30% is going to be raining next week. So that's, the, that's the, the warming up and the training that goes on. It takes a few minutes. Then we ask these questions. When we, when we do that, we don't let, uh, we, the interviewer cannot correct mistakes. So if they make mistakes, they will be in the data. So there will be some inconsistency uh, in the data. And, but as I say, they work uh, reasonably well. So that's, the, that's the how we collected the data, both in, uh, in uh, Colombia and in, in India. Uh, and, uh, as I mentioned, the, 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 um, the New York Fed does something similar, but it's not exactly the same. The anchoring is done on current income. 
So again, they don't impose any anchoring. They let them do it, but it's done on the, on the current income. So they say, what's, um, what's the probability that your income relative to what it is now will increase by 2%, 4%, 6%, etc. So it's a, it's a different pr approach. And so we, we went this particular way. <coughs> so we then write down a model of the perceived income process. And then what we want to do is to link its parameter to the available data on subjective expectations. And so the general idea is that given the specification of our model, we want to fit uh, the CDF implied by that specific model um, uh, to, the, uh, to the answers that we receive on the subjective expectations probability. <coughs> so given that households have some, some process in their mind, um, the uh, household subjective probability distribution or log future income is expressed in that particular fashion where R is an arbitrary uh, a point. So that's the CDF for household I at time T and, that's, uh, and the I is the information available to that household at, 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 uh, at time T. Given this, um, Effectively, the answers <coughs> to, the, um, to the questions that we have are given by those expressions. So the R, J, I, T are, uh, the J are the A, B, and C in the, in the pictures. So the, the, those were the, the red dots, uh, the, the red letters in, in my picture, and, and, and that, uh, that's that. Um, you can see that the approach here is different. If you think of the standard um, models that are used to, uh, to analyze um, household income in panel data, we have a model and then there is the income realization. S there are some residuals to that and that's what it is. Here we are mapping not the actual realization, although those, as we'll see, might be in the information set available to agents. But we are mapping the CDF implied by the model to the answers given uh, by that. Given the assumption we'll be making is useful uh, to use a logic transformation as we'll see. So I, the L star there is the, is the odds ratio uh, that you can get from a, lo from a logic model. That's, uh, that's the formula there. <clears throat> Um, so then we model the log of uh, the subjective uh, cumulative odds so that outcomes have the, uh, in a limited range of variation and the elicitation errors uh, are probably plausibly additive. So we assume that the, uh, what we observe is somehow affected by measurement error. So it's not really the, the, the um, the subjective expectation, but is that plus, uh, plus uh, some error which is a bit additive. Uh, so what we observe is um, um, a transformation of LJIT, which is the true LJIT plus measurement error. Um, we, we do some, there, are, there is a little bit of bunching at zero and one, not a huge amount, and we don't want to throw away those data. So we use this cock transform to avoid um, uh, throwing away. That, that's not a, really an important point. We, that's what we do if we don't do it and throw away the, there are not very many zero and ones. <coughs> so if you have throw away those, uh, those data, we get effectively the same results. So it's not particularly. We assume that uh, the information available to individuals is Markovian in the sense that um, the current values of relevant variables is what matters to, uh, to predict uh, uh, the fu uh, future. And um, <clears throat> the time various variables that we use to model this uh, Markovian process are the current available income or the households at the time when the, when the, the information is collected plus a bunch of other variables uh, which we call them XIT, which could reflect the nature and sources of income. So, you, you know, how many people work uh, currently, what kind of occupations they have, and things like that. <coughs> uh, 
So, um, as for the, those are time variant characteristics. We consider the possibility of time invariance characteristics, but those will be absorbed by fixed effects. So, we'll have models with fixed effect that they absorb all, the, all things that don't move over time. Um, and, and these capture both the household level and the village level uh, characteristics. So that's the form that our model takes. The L star uh, is a function G of the, the particular point you consider, the R, I, J, I, T, and the observable variables and the fixed effects. And for each household, notice that we have three observations because the J, is, you know, these are the three red points, the, the, the probability that com, uh, correspond to a, B, and C. So for each household, we have those three, three points. <coughs> and G is a non-decreasing function in, the, in its first argument, which is R, is the, is the A, B, and C. Um, so now, how do we do this uh, with, uh, how do we put this uh, structure in, in practice? So uh, next point is we map models uh, to subjective expectations data. And we start with the uh, simplest model. Uh, it's useful, uh, if nothing else, to illustrate uh, uh, some of the points we make. And so we, uh, we start with a linear model with fixed effects. So that's the one. So this is uh, household I at time t plus one. Their income, uh, that's the log of income, is uh, uh, dependent on the current income with a, a persistent parameter rho. Uh, a fixed effect alpha i, some households are permanently richer or poorer than others, and uh, some random term v, which is scaled with, um, <coughs> with um, variability sigma. Uh, in this particular illustration, we assume that the v is a logistic, and it's independent of uh, y and alpha. Um, we can do it with a probit, which how is prob maybe more common in the literature. We get very similar results. Uh, the logic is easier in this context because of the um, odds ratio stuff that gives linearity in a very natural way. As we can see here, so the, the corresponding conditional CDF is given by uh, these expressions. And, um, and therefore, once you apply the logic transformation, the model becomes fully linear, not in current income. It becomes linear in the, in the answers that we get from the conditional probability, uh, from subjective probability questions. And so uh, we have that, that expression there. Um, so the, the left hand side are the, P, are the P over one minus P that we get from the subjective expectation. The right hand side are the R, the, the points of the subjective expectations that are the same across people. Um, the way it's computed is same across people. Then there is the current thing, there is a fixed effect, and there is a measurement error error, uh, measurement error, the epsilon. So that's it. That's, uh, uh, once you have this equation, you can apply standard uh, methods uh, to, uh, to estimate it. <coughs> and as I mentioned, you can do everything with probit. You get, uh, you get a similar kind of expressions if you assume normality rather than uh, logistic. Um, notice that there is, an imp you know, as I said, this is a linear panel model with fixed effect and strictly exogenous regressors. That's the first important difference. You know, uh, the, um, don't, you don't need to use uh, IV approaches. Uh, you can use within estimates, uh, estimation, uh, and you're not subject to what we call the nickel bias uh, if you have very short t's. And that comes from the, from, the, from the nature of the residual, from the nature of the data. When you do uh, regress a future income on current income and you have fixed effect, you have these out, out, um, biases that if your T dimension is short, will introduce uh, severe biases. And that's one of the headaches that, uh, that time panel people data have. We don't have that here. 
it's, um, it, it's much more uh, flexible in a way uh, to, to estimate this. It's much simpler to estimate these models if your data are reliable. <coughs> now, having said that, the linearity still imposes a lot of structure on, the, on this problem. Uh, th there is a very tight uh, uh, set of assumptions that, you know, the persistence uh, and the variability are the two parameters that control everything. So the persistence is the same for everybody, is wrong, and, uh, and is the same for any realization of income. So it's a, it's a very tight parameterization. <coughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, and as we'll see, we relax uh, uh, some of these assumptions uh, in what follows. Now, what's the difference between using this expectation data versus actual? And already hinted, there are some similarities. Uh, you know, the, the sort of linear model that we ended up, they look similar in a way. But there are very uh, profound uh, differences uh, or between the um, uh, two approaches. First of all, if you don't have fixed effects, you can, uh, you, you can estimate this dynamic model with one single cross-section. Um, and uh, if you have a full model with fixed effect, you will need two. But still, you can, you, you can do it in a, in a fairly simple way. And this is because with the subjective expectations, you effectively introduce the variation that you use uh, to estimate, uh, to identify these parameters. So the, uh, the approach is different. <coughs> and as I just mentioned, the uh, estimation of subjective expectation model does not far suffer from the, uh, from the nickel bias. Uh, and the reason for that is the outcomes are not future incomes, but the points of the uh, CDF. Um, and therefore the, the error term does not contain future shocks which in turn c contain the fixed effect and induce the nickel bias. So that's all very nice. Um, and three, um, th the, the, this approach does not force individuals to have rational expectations. People ha can have the wrong type of expectations. They can, they can be misperceptions. Now testing whether the expectations are rational or not is a different um, it's a different problem and it's not easy um, if, you, if you allow for aggregate shocks and the like. <coughs> but uh, in this approach, we don't have to assume uh, rational expectations. And then we move on and uh, try to look at more flexible models. And so that's the type of model. So again, we use the, the, the logistic uh, transformation that we used before to get the L so the, the left hand side is as before is the, um, um, the um, log of uh, odd ratios. Um, so those are the answers for the, uh, the, the pies that we get. <coughs> On the right hand side, uh, we allow this, uh, um, the effect of the R's and of the current income um, and of the fixed effect to be nonlinear. And so we use um, the betas that uh, will be uh, splines uh, in what we use, uh, in what we do, and uh, the psi is um, orthogonal, orthogonal polynomials. So you get more flexibility and uh, a, a, a much richer uh, model. Uh, having said that, you know, the model is much more complicated and to estimate it, you have to be precise about what the debate these functions, these splines and the orthogonal polynomials are. But once you specify that the, the methods uh, are not, uh, not too difficult. <coughs> once we have those estimates, it becomes a little bit harder uh, to interpret the results. So what we do is um, we look at um, quantile based measures of dispersion, skewness, and persistence. Uh, and so, therefore, we need to be able to calculate the implied quantiles uh, from our conditional CDF. And so, we define the quantile uh, here, um, uh, so th the quantile tau in particular, and then uh, from the model, we get the, the logit of tau is going to be the G function. And the G function will depend on the, on, on the specification 
we use. For instance, for the linear autoregressive model, the quantile is that expression, and as we saw, persistence is just param parameter is the is the row there. <coughs> um, and uh, for more complex model, we can uh, found a numerical solution to to the specific quantiles. So for dispersion, we use and we report numbers or estimates on the interquartile range. Uh, we usually look at um, uh, the 75th and the 90th uh, percentile of the distribution. Um, so that's, that's one. And for skewness, let's skip the skewness, is the Bolli Kelly measure. This is one of the many things I've been learning from uh, Manolo, uh, because I, I, I didn't know this, but it's, that's a specific me measure of, um, of uh, skewness. For uh, uh, persistence, uh, we used uh, what um, ABB proposed in their econometric paper. So it's the derivative of um, the, um, uh, the quantile uh, um, as if, uh, to, with respect to the current income. And so that could be different at different quantiles. It could be different in, uh, in the distribution of fixed effects. Uh, so that's, um, that's what we report. <coughs> Okay, a, uh, for the linear model, it's just a constant, it's, it's raw everywhere. <clears throat> okay, uh, estimation approach, uh, we, I already said that we use a, 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 a piecewise linear spline specification and um, with L knots, typically we do uh, one, zero, one and two knots. Uh, I think the numbers that I will report will be with two, uh, two knots in the, in the thing. And then we have a Hermite polynomial for, uh, for the Psi function. Uh, le let me skip this. Is, these are technicalities. There, there I have a couple of, uh, um, this is actually quite interesting, but it would take me some time. In my, um, the way we, you can introduce in this approach aggregate risk. Um, maybe getting the estimates from um, additional data, separate data. But A, we were not very successful, successful in obtaining anything from the data we have on, on aggregate. And B, it would take me quite a bit of time to go through these slides. So let me skip the aggregate risks. And because I do want to get the results that we get. Uh, and we, I'll present first results for the linear model and then for the nonlinear extension. Uh, so this is a summary for uh, the results on India. <clears throat> we have a model with and without fixed effects. Um, and then when uh, considering the fixed effect, we decompose the total variance of individual fixed effects into the variance across villages and within villages. We have about 40 villages in the Indian, uh, sorry, 60 villages in the India uh, data. Um, in the Indian data, the measure of persistence rho uh, is very close to unity, and uh, is unaffected. This is the linear model, so it's just um, uh, and is unaffected by the consideration of fixed effects, which suggests that heterogeneity in expectation is not strongly correlated with uh, with income. Um, the, uh, including fixed effects does make a difference. So the total variability, uh, a big chunk of it is, at, is accounted for by fixed effect, but the persistence in the India data is not, a, is not uh, affected by that. So that's the linear model for, for India. Um, <clears throat> we have um, you know, very close to one, very f close to a random walk. Uh, you can see that the uh, sigma goes from 0.44 to 0.27 uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, introducing fixed effect, and that's the interquartile range, etc. And you know the sigma a once we have the fixed uh, uh, effect uh, is uh, the the part that is accounted across villages and within. Uh, within villages, and sigma epsilon is the measurement error. All these standard errors are computed by uh, Bootstrap here. For Colombia, uh, things are uh, quite a bit different. Um, so uh, we, we do the exactly the same e exercise. So when we don't get fixed effect, uh, the, again, the row is very close to one. 
Once we introduce the fixed effect, it drops down dramatically. Uh, so quite a bit of the <coughs> Uh, of, the, uh, of the persistence is, uh, is seems to be driven by the presence of fixed effect. You can see it here. In the first column has no fixed effect, so the, the coefficient is 1, and then uh, um, uh, it drops down to 0.47 once you introduce the, uh, the fixed effect. One thing that I should have mentioned that I didn't is the questions for India and Colombia are a little bit different in the sense that um, in the case uh, of uh, India, we ask them for the income next year. In the case of Colombia, we'll ask them the income next month. So it could be that these differences might be driven by the different horizon uh, that is considered. Um, okay, so those, those are the data for Colombia. Now, all the, uh, the specifications so far don't have um, uh, any, um, yeah, that's what I mentioned, they don't have any um, access. It's just uh, income. Uh, so the, then the next step is uh, extending these linear models to include uh, uh, observable variables like income sources and we interact those variables with the current income. In the Indian data, the sources refer to the number of activities that the household gets the income from, which could be farming, agriculture, labor, trade, etc. Um, the persistence is not greatly affected by, by this. Uh, it's still one and one uh, with or without fixed effect. Um, the main difference is that persistence is higher for households with a, a sizable fraction of their income obtained from farming activities. So this is, uh, this is the results we, uh, we get. Um, okay. And then uh, for Colombia, sources mean uh, number of household members with positive earnings from their weekly uh, activity. And we have 15, 20% that is three or more sources. So this is a relevant uh, 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 source of variation. And we observed that uh, quite a bit of uh, differences in persistence according to the number of sources uh, of income. So the Colombian, you know, the, the main difference, the way I see it, is that India is always one, the persistence is always one, regardless of what you do, or to a large extent. In the case of Colombia, um, the consideration fixed effect uh, matters, and uh, the introduction of this new variables matters quite a bit for, for persistence. So this, uh, uh, this, are the result. This, are, this table has got fixed effect. And you can see that the, um, uh, the row is uh, 0 0.4 uh, for uh, one sources and, and goes to 0 0.6 uh, when you consider more sources. Now, uh, the second uh, step is going to nonlinear models. So that's the sort of model that I gave you before. Uh, in the uh, India data, we find a, 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 quite a bit of heteroskedasticity. The uh, rich is probably the wrong uh, word there, but the, the less poor individuals uh, face less risk and have ne negative skewness. Uh, the persistence is non-linear in the sense that the position in the income distribution and size of shock matters for persistence. Remember, in the linear model, we got a one everywhere. Once you introduce nonlinearity, there are some deviations from the random walk that depends on, uh, on where you are, both in terms of current realization and in terms of uh, position in the distribution of fixed effect. <clears throat> and, the, uh, and for the Indian data, the income sources do not matter much. Um, and uh, these nonlinearities are uh, there regarding on whether you include these observables or not. Uh, implication is that the linear model is very strongly rejected in the, in the India data. Now, you say, okay, these are the obsessions of econometricians. They want to reject simple models. I think it's a much more than that because the consideration of these different types of models and risk and persistence will have important implication for optimal savings, for uh, insurance arrangements, for intra-household insurance, uh, for the enforceability of uh, insurance contracts, and all that. So this is not 
these are not um, just technical results. They are results that have important uh, policy implications. So the, uh, these are the, uh, these, uh, where they are. Um, and you can see that um, uh, if, if you focus uh, for a second on, how do I do this? On the, on the row, um, you can see that it can, they vary in two dimensions. One is the current income realization and, and one is the percentile in the fixed effect uh, distribution. Uh, and you can see that, you know, here, if you go bottom right is 0.8, bottom left is 0.5, um, top left uh, is one, 1, is the random walk, uh, uh, top right is 1.6. So it goes all over the places, this, uh, this parameter, it's a l large variability. And the same uh, uh, holds uh, for the interquartile, <coughs> for the interquartile uh, measures or 90-10 measures of uh, variability. Uh, the, r the richer individuals, they face less risk than, than the poor um, in, in general. Uh, for Colombia, <coughs> uh, introducing the observable does matter for deviation from nonlinearity. You still reject um, the, the, the model, but um, uh, not as much pa as in India. So in Colombia, once you introduce uh, uh, these interactions, then uh, you still have significant deviations from nonlinearity, but they're less important. Um, and uh, what we observe there is that high persistence is concentrated among households with three or more earners uh, with, lo with low income and negative shocks. Um, and so there is uh, some sort of, uh, again, the implication for policy is uh, a situation of uh, persistence and misery uh, at the, uh, 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 at the, on the left tail of the income uh, uh, d distribution. <coughs> uh, so those are, those are the results uh, for, uh, for Colombia. <coughs> um, what are the conclusions and, uh, and the next steps? I would love to receive some questions at the end. Um, I think in terms of what we learned uh, is that um, the, um, fr in terms of econometrics, the sort of methodology and, and challenges that you face when using this um, subject subjective expectation data are very, very different. When you use uh, actual data, uh, you have uh, uh, you need a big T, typically, to estimate models with fixed effects. Here we don't. Um, it's a different ap approach. Um, it's also very attractive because um, you can uh, get these um, uh, measures of heteroscedasticity, skewness, and nonlinear persistence as perceived by the individuals uh, in, in your sample uh, rather than imposed them. Uh, in, um, uh, in at least in one case, the standard linear model is strongly rejected, um, in, although in the other one is, um, uh, is the treatment of fixed effects have di very different implications for the two data sets. Um, and so one conclusion is that it's not only current income, but also it's nature and sources that matter for risk in a different way in the two countries, but, uh, but that's definitely true. It could be that, and as I said, could these dip differences, uh, we don't have an answer to that, but it could be that these differences are driven by the fact that the horizon is one month in the case and, and 12 months in the other case. When you have 12 months, you probably average out a bunch of shocks dur during the year. Uh, more generally, the, the questions um, uh, that elicit to the probability distribution of future income uh, give you a different approach to the identification of, of uh, a dynamic linear pa uh, dynamic panel data uh, model. <coughs> this I mentioned. What are the next step? Um, you know, I think this approach has also implication for more complex models. Uh, with Manolo and another set of co-authors, um, <coughs> we are involved uh, in, um, 
in a, pro in a project that is trying to estimate uh, process uh, earnings processes, but also which also incorporate uh, discrete elements like unemployment risk, uh, uh, changes from job to job, changes of occupation. We are using the data from that are collected by New York uh, Fed, um, and and there once you start dealing with the selection issues implied by employment and changes in occupation, uh, you can see that. The, um, the identification that you can achieve is much richer here. Because when you do um, a standard models, typically, you know, it's the standard Heckman uh, equation when you have uh, wages that you only observe for the currently unemployed. That's a selected sample. To identify non parametrically that, you will need some exclusion restrictions. Here, with subjective data, you don't. And the reason you don't is because uh, effectively you're, you're playing God and you present this respondent with all possible scenarios. And so you induce the variability that allows to model explicitly a selection into a change in job or into unemployment um, uh, directly. So the identification becomes much, much easier. It's a different issue. Again, you put on the left-hand side these uh, CDFs. You don't put actual income realization. Um, and you put in, in this particular case, you put the CDFs under different scenarios. So if you keep the same, that's what they do at the Fed. If, if you keep the, the same job and work the same number of hours, what's the probability distribution of your future earning? What's the probability you receive a job offer? What's the probability you'll accept a job offer? What's the probability distribution of offers that you receive? That's what they ask at, at, at your Fed, and it seems to be good data. We have started analyzing, and uh, hopefully soon we'll have some results as well. So that's uh, that's big goal, uh, and I'll, I'll stop here if there are any questions. <laughs> Where is Pablo? dimensions that one I would have thought were at least partially captured by the fixed effect. So the biases are obviously not the same and uh, obviously the, the model is not the same, but still the fact that they are so, uh, they, they don't change at all uh, with the fixed effects I found surprising. And then the second question I had is, to what extent do you feel the differences in your two samples have to do with Colombia versus India or, or rather with the agricultural sampling in uh, one uh, of the data sets? The other one, if I remember that correctly, seems to be more urban, um, uh, a more urban group. I, and so I just want to okay. take your brain. In terms of, the, of the, fi uh, the effect of fixed effects and being different, there was a, a bit of a surprise. <coughs> Among my econometrician friends, some were doing uh, income processes. Uh, some tend to think that fixed effects are not that important for generating persistence. Others think otherwise. So the answer of that is, uh, you know, the nature of the, of the process is what's driving uh, this thing. So the fact that in one country, once you introduce fixed effects, the measure persistence goes down dramatically it's an indication that the, 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 um, the process is such that the, the fixed effect itself uh, generates the observed persistence. In the other case, in the case of India, that was not uh, the case. Um, it's also, as you noticed, the, um, uh, in the case of Colombia, um, the persistence is also driven by down by the consideration of specific um, uh, changeable variables like num uh, sources of income and, and, and the like. 
we we don't have it inside, uh, a very strong answer to that, but we feel that some of these differences are driven by um, the fact the difference in horizon. So the fact that in Colombia is um, uh, one month ahead, in India is one year ahead. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is data that we collected many years ago. We, we were thinking in those terms at, at the time. Uh, I, I don't know where they come from. In terms of the, uh, it's true that there are very different societies. Colombia is a very specific sample, although it's not representative of Colombia. It's, these are all small town. 63 percent is agriculture here. So, so yeah, it, it, it's probably even more important in India, but uh, but this is not Bogota. This uh, towns uh, around 20,000, if not much smaller than, uh, quite a bit smaller than that. Chico. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Horacio. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, I guess, using the subjective CDFs to estimate dynamic models, there's an underlying assumption that there aren't systematic biases, right, of the kinds that behavioral economists might say. So, for example, if you had, uh, you know, systematic optimism or something like that, that would be a problem. And then it occurred to me that if you had a sufficiently long time series of realizations afterwards, you could use it to test or, or validate those hypotheses. Yeah. And in fact, those things might even vary across the distribution. You might have biases that are different across quantiles of, of, of the distribution. I don't know how long the time series would have to be, and I wonder if that's in your agenda or not. Yeah, I, no, this is a very good question, a very important question. I mentioned it is very difficult to, task, uh, to test rationality. Uh, I have, you know, one which is not really an answer to your, your question is to say, look, if you want to put expectations in, uh, in uh, optimization models that people have in their heads, this is the right data to use because that's their perception and their perception c might be biased. Uh, you know, I have another paper, completely different approach, looking at the, how people uh, bought cars during the Great Recession. And there, because we don't have expect subjective expectation data, we use the car choices to reverse engineer perception of uh, future income expectations. And we find that during the Great Recession, people had very dire expectations about the future, which might not have been completely justified. So I don't think, you know, if we can move away from the assumption of rational expectations, it's a good thing if you do it in a consistent way. Now, how many waves do I need to test for rationality? And uh, you're absolutely right. It could be that these um, biases or misperceptions of the future are different across the income distribution. That's completely plausible. Uh, how I go... I, you need quite a bit of data. One dimension, so there was something work we done in the first paper with Britta in 2016. <coughs> we used variation across villages. They're a re relatively isolated uh, thing. So you might not have uh, the ability to test the rationality uh, of expectations about aggregate shocks across villages, but uh, you can do that. And, and there we were kind of trying to validate the expectation data. People don't have crazy ideas. You know, my main worry when, I start, when we start working with this data is that do this data make any sense or are we just uh, analyzing noise? Uh, you know, this was a valid worry that the profession at large had for many years. And I think it takes uh, quite a bit of work in designing the questionnaires and, and stuff to, to make this uh, plausible. You know, we've been collecting this expect subjective expectations data in lots of different places. We've done it in uh, Mongolia, in Tanzania, in um, Colombia, in India. One thing that I learned, there is no bullet, uh, silver bullet. Every context needs a different approach uh, to, you know, we use a lot of this um, <clears throat> visual aids, it could be a ruler where people indicate a probability on a ruler, that's what we use in this too. 
in Mongolia, that thing didn't work at all, so we had to do a, a different st stuff. And so you might use the uh, beans to distribute. Uh, so, so you have to do it. It's not easy, but uh, I think it's a worth, uh, worthwhile effort uh, to, to, to devise new methods. Any more? Thank you for a great presentation. Um, in, when you measure similar data in Progressa and you use the mean max and the middle point, and you're assuming a triangular distribution, I was wondering if you, you, you could do that with this data as well. And I was wondering uh, if you compare the measurements using both approaches, what do you gain? You, you, uh, gathering five points of the distribution rather than three? Yeah, in the case of Pro the Progressa was one of the first time we did it, uh, and we only did it for a subsample. And um, and uh, as you pointed, I'm amazed that you know that paper. But uh, uh, we divide the interval in two, and we ask the probability of being below or above the midpoint. This is richer because it's, it's done. An interesting thing we did in that uh, in, in that uh, work, we never wrote that up, but this, the results is there. So what we did, we randomized. So we, we did minimax, and then we compute the midpoint. And then we randomized half the sample. We asked, what's the probability that is below the midpoint? And the ha other half, we asked, what's the probability is above the midpoint? And then, then we test the hypothesis that uh, the two sum up to one, which is you know, an indirect test of the consistency of these answers. And they do. Uh, again, I never, we never wrote up that paper. But, uh, but they do. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Horacio. <laughs> uh, we have to make a stop here, just a five-minute stop in order to start the keynote lectures. Thank you. <laughs>